The following teaching is possible thanks to the friends and partners of Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. sitting? Mount of, Mount of Olives. How many remember the model city yesterday and can kind of picture that in your mind? You kind of kind of got that in your mind? Okay, so then right behind us, you see the big gold dome? Yep. Okay, that's the, the Mosque of Omar. Or we know it is the Dome of the Rock. And the kind of gray black dome to the south is over the El Aqsa Mosque. The important thing to remember is that that the, at least the bigger stones, if you look at the El Aqsa Mosque, if you look at the Dome of the El Aqsa, and then you come straight down, you see the, the wall that's right in front of us that's turreted. You see that? It has the, the little, uh, uh, huh? Yeah, embattlements. Yeah, it looks like dental work, exactly, for the world. It looks like dental work on a, on a you know, in a, in a room. Okay, that, that top part with the top dental worky stuff, that's from the tent, that's from the, the Turkish time. But if you look down underneath that, you see very, very large stones. Do you see that? Yeah. Now those stones are from the temple time of Christ. They go all the way back to the time of Christ, and they may even go back a little further than that. But we're sure they go back to the time of Christ, and that defines the eastern wall of the temple. And then between us and the eastern wall of the temple, what's the valley? the Kidron Valley. So you need to be oriented. Now where the, not where, I believe, not where the Dome of the Rock is, but slightly to the north of it. And we will be inside that. This then would be the temple area, this huge enclosure here enclosed by this wall. Again, how big would this be? About 37 acres. And then inside that would be the, the temple proper. Okay, and the, the temple proper, I believe, is going to be just a little tiny bit north of the Dome of the Rock. There are various theologies about the, where exactly was the temple at the time of Christ. And there are archaeologists who say it is right on top of the Dome of the Rock. And there are other archaeologists, and I've studied both sides, yeah. and I am, uh, at least where I'm settled now, is that the temple of, at Christ's time was just slightly north of the Dome of the Rock, maybe even 10 or 15 yards. It's my personal belief. Do you remember that there's a time when the Antichrist will make a pact with Israel? And we know from the book of Revelation that Israel will be, rebuild the temple. Preparations for that are being made. We will go to the Temple Institute Museum where they've already made the golden menorah. We will see that they've already made some of the flesh hooks and they've made some of the instruments for, for working the temple. We will already see that. Then last night we met Reuven Prager. He's introducing the half shekel so you can pay the tax that's, that's owed to the temple and introducing the Jewish dress um, and, the, and the Jewish wedding, the traditional wedding. So these, all these things are being introduced. My personal belief is that when the Antichrist and, the, and Israel makes a pact, part of that pact will be that the temple will be allowed to be built right on top of the Temple Mount. Now, notice how easily you could see the temple if it was standing right there. Okay, and, and this is going to be very important. Now, again, the, the Mount of Olives has a tremendous significance. And I want to go back and I want to take a look at some of the history of the Mount of Olives. So let's get your Bible, if you will. By the way, we're at the top of the Mount of Olives is about 2,700 feet. And in 2 Samuel 15, 30, that's the, the Mount of Olives is specifically mentioned twice in the Scripture. And in 2 Samuel 15, 30, this is when David, King David, was running from his son Absalom. Absalom had formed a conspiracy against David, and David was caught off guard, and he had to flee the city of Jerusalem. In verse 30 of 2 Samuel 15 says, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. And why would he be crying? 
His own son has formed a rebellion against him, and he's having to flee his city. Now, when we're looking over here at the temple, the temple area, who would have built the temple first? Solomon would have built the temple right on that area, right in that area, and be before. Do you see how it's a higher spot? Before it was a temple, it was a threshing floor. We'll, we'll go to a place where we can see what a threshing floor looks like, but basically it's a flat place, and you wanted it up where it would catch the breeze, and you'd, you'd throw the grains up in the air, and the chaff would blow away, and the round grain would fall back down. So the temple area was at one time a threshing floor, and God said, I will choose a place for the temple. God said, I will choose it, and he chose that spot right there. David bought it. Solomon built the temple there. Obviously, if it was a threshing floor in the time of David, then it wasn't where David lived. It wasn't David's city. If we come off the south end of the wall and just go right out that, that spit of land, you look down the Kidron, you look up the other side, you can see where David's city was. Now there's a few houses on top of it, and you can actually see a little piece of wall down there when we did Hezekiah's tunnel. If you look at the hillside, come off, you see those two buses right now rounding the corner? Go, go to the south about four fingers width and on the hillside, you see what looks like some rocks going down. Do you see that? Okay, that would be the wall of the city of David and that little spit is where the city of David was. And what Solomon did was he built up, he built up into the, the Temple Mount area, so that, so that this view was the view from the city of David. And of course, David would leave the city of David, go down into the Kidron, come up over the Mount of Olives. He's headed east. Eventually, he'll cross the Jordan River. That's the first time in Scripture that the Mount of Olives is mentioned. Then, it doesn't say it specifically, but if you look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 11, In 1 Kings chapter 11, and starting in verse 1, this is the end of Solomon's life. Now, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, he began to build the temple. And he built it. It took seven years to complete. So the temple right there, where you know, approximately where the Dome of the Rock is, that temple was built early on in the reign of Solomon. When, when Solomon became successful, and sometimes for some people success is hard to handle. When Solomon became successful, he became ungodly, and he started breaking commandments, and that's a, a teaching all to its own about all the commandments that Solomon broke. But if you look at chapter 11, verse 1, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which Yahweh had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Now, did, what was God's word? Don't intermarry. What Solomon do? Intermarry. He intermarries with all these women. And it says, God said you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your heart after other gods. And it's, it's interesting how this works in a relationship. But how many people do you know that say have, have joined a church with beliefs that are not according to the word? They make friends with the people in the church and then they're like, oh, I just can't say they're wrong. If they, then it's, it, there's just, you have a much harder time than taking a stand for truth. So Solomon marries all these women, and when he's old, you know, he's like, well, I really like these girls, you know, and, and after all, I mean, okay, so there's Yahweh, but why can't there be other gods too? Of course there can be. And he starts to make compromises on God's word, and that's what happens when you fellowship with darkness. Does God say don't fellowship with darkness? Yeah. Yes, he does. It's, it's a choice. It's like, for example, when, when we do premarital counseling and you've got a guy and a girl, 
And let's say the, the girl's a Christian and the guy is uh, not a Christian. He doesn't go to church. He likes to go out with the boys on Friday night and get drunk. Um, he may be an occasional user of, of recreational drugs or whatever. But, but she says, but he loves me so much. But he's got such a big heart. But, 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 but. You know, and, and, and pretty soon you get, you get pulled in. It can go the other way as well. You know, you, you can get pulled in by your emotions. Somebody on the outside with a more objective viewpoint, what do they say? They say, don't get involved. See, the, the time to see darkness is not when you're involved. The time to see darkness is from the outside in. If, if you know that friendship with darkness corrupts good morals and good behavior, then don't get involved. You say, look, you know, I'm, I'm not going in that direction. Congregationally, we shouldn't either. Here is Solomon and his wives turned away his heart. Verse 3, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And a concubine is a lesser wife, usually uh, a person that was given as a gift. His wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Verse 6 is very plain. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Real simple. People say Solomon was the wisest person that ever lived, and this is an interesting statement. It, just because you're wise and you know how to do things doesn't mean you're godly. There are very many wise people that, that really can, I mean, they can be very wise about money. They can be very wise about their own personal body or their health. They can be very wise about their profession, but that doesn't mean they're godly. And it's important to, to know that because people read that because Solomon was wise, therefore he must be godly, but you can't connect the two necessarily. Godliness is one thing, wisdom is another. When Solomon was on his reign early on, he was very godly and very wise. But when his heart was turned away, the scripture will still testify that he had wisdom, but he didn't have godliness. If you are wise about, you know, about eternity, then you live godly. So he goes, his, his, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of Yahweh. He did not follow Yahweh completely as David his father has done. Verse 7, on a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their god. Now, there's Jerusalem. What's the hill east of Jerusalem? We're on, We're on it. It's called the Mount of Olives. What's down the slope of the Mount of Olives? The Judean wilderness. Right. So, I, I, although the scripture does not say he built these high places on the, on the Mount of Olives, I don't think if you know the topography, if you know the fifth gospel, the land, if you can get a, get a feel for that, then I don't think there's any doubt where he built this. And what an insult to God that these high places to Moloch, to Chemosh, to the Ashtaroth would look down upon the temple of God. And so by the time you go to 2 Kings, let's please go to, to uh, 2 Kings chapter 23. And this is, this is Josiah now, Josiah lived hundreds of years after Solomon. In verse 12 of 2 Kings 23, it says, Josiah pulled down the altars the, uh, the kings of Judah had erected on the roof near the upper room of Ahaz and the altars Manasseh had built in the two courts of the temple of Yahweh. He removed them from there, smashed them to pieces, and threw the rubble into the what? Kidron Valley. Kidron Valley. And that's an important point to know. Uh, because the, the bottom of the Kidron Valley, as deep as it is, is not as deep as it was in the time of David. 
because for years rubble and things have been pushed into the Kidron Valley. So the floor of the Kidron Valley has come up. Some people are saying as much as maybe 60 to 80 feet. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of rubble that the floor of the Kidron has come up. And then it says, verse 13, the king also desecrated the high places that were east of Jerusalem on the hill of corruption. And that's very interesting. It's called the Mount of Olives, but when it's covered with idolatrous high places, God calls it the hill of corruption. The ones Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtaroth, the vile goddess of the Zidonians, for Chemosh, the vile god of Moab, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the people of, of Ammon. Joash smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles and covered the sites with human bones. And of course, that makes them unclean. It's, it's interesting to me that here it says, the ones Solomon had made. Now, Hezekiah tore down all the high places, so it's possible for a brief period during the reign of, Hosea, of Hezekiah, rather, these high places were torn down up here on the top of the Mount of Olives and then rebuilt by the people because as soon as Hezekiah would die and an ungodly king take over, then I think Solomon's high places would be rebuilt. Apparently, after Josiah, they weren't rebuilt after that. Well, for one thing, Judah was destroyed, not too many kings afterward. But in any case, if you can think of the embarrassment to God that all up on the top of this mountain overlooking the temple would be these high places. Now let's look at Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, Zechariah Malachi. That'll give you a, a, a kind of a benchmark. Just go to Malachi Matthew and then go back to Zechariah. And Zechariah 14 speaks of the, the, the battles in the book of, of Revelation during the tribulation time. And it also talks about the end of the tribulation, the day of the Lord, and the battle of Armageddon. Chapter 14, verse 1 of Zechariah says, A day of Yahweh is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. Now remember that there's, uh, remember that the Antichrist and the country of Israel, according to the book of Revelation and according to the book of Daniel, make a what? They make a pact, they make a covenant, they make a treaty. But after a while, what happens? That pact is broken and the Antichrist attacks Jerusalem. And Christ even spoke of, in Matthew 24, he said, when you see the, the abomination of spoken about by Daniel standing in the holy place, what's the holy place? The temple. We're not positive what the abomination of desolation is, but I'm sure that they will know it when it occurs. One of the interesting things about prophecy is sometimes it's unclear until it's very close to being fulfilled. But, what, but Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 said, look, when you guys see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then flee into the mountains get out of Jerusalem, beat your feet, don't even go back in, run. Why? Because the armies of the Antichrist are going to attack Jerusalem. Here's what it says. Verse 2, I will gather all nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will what? Not be taken from the city. Verse 3, then Yahweh will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and he will be represented in who? In his son, Jesus Christ. Exactly. He will uh, stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. So Jesus Christ, remember the kings are gathered at Megiddo, but how far is the blood of the battle of Armageddon going to flow? 180 miles, the entire land of Israel is going to be covered with, with uh, soldiers and there'll be blood flowing all over. When Jesus Christ gets to the Jerusalem to conquer it, 
He will stand on the Mount of Olives. And when he does, it says, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north, half the mountain moving south. south. Do you get that? So right there from the temple, there'll be a valley flowing to the Dead Sea. That half of the Mount of Olives is going to go north. Where we're sitting on the Mount of Olives probably will go south. It, the, the break might occur just a little bit south of us, but I doubt it from where we are now because the water's going to flow out of the south side of the temple, so we're really close. Which side of the break are we on right now? We're, we're very close. Look what it, it keep reading. It says, um, verse 4, Five, you will flee by my mountain valley, for it will ascend to Azale. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. I trust that some of those holy ones are us. Verse 6, on that day, will be, on that day there will be no light, uh, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to Yahweh. When evening comes, there will be light. Verse 8, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and half to the western, western sea. The eastern sea we call the Dead Sea. Dead sea. The western sea we call the Mediterranean. Mediterranean Sea, right. In summer and as winter. In other words, it's not going to be one of those things that only flows during the rainy season. If you come here during the rainy season, you can see water down the Kidron Valley and down the Annan Valley and all that, and it rains and the water goes in the bottom. You know, you could see water uh, in, in the Kishon River and that kind of thing, and, Christ, and specifically mentions here in summer and in winter, the water's going to flow. And then verse 9, Yahweh will be king over the whole earth. Exactly. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. All the other gods are going to be done away with. We can see this a little better if we look to Ezekiel chapter 37. It's 47. I was going to say, that's not where it is. Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 and verse 1, it says, The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple. And that's why I say I'm not sure where the, the valley is going to split, because if the simple temple is there, the south side is going to be very close to parallel where we are right now. So if there's the valley running this way, it probably cracks right about through where we are. And whether this exact stone would move south or north, eh, we're probably pretty close right to the crack. It says, uh, the, the water was coming down under the south side of the temple, south of the altar, verse 2. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. The water was flowing from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line on his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, then led me through the water that was ankle deep. A cubit basically is about inch, uh, an inch and a half, so it's about 1,800 feet. Something like, wait a minute, foot and a half, foot and a half is a cubit. <laughs> so it's, so it's um, not 1,800 feet, it's uh, uh, 1,500 feet. There you go, something like that, shoot, I forget. Oh, uh, yeah, 1,500 feet. Okay, so it's about 1,500 feet, and then the water's ankle deep. He measured off another 1,000 cubits, led me through water that was knee deep. Measured off another 1,000, he led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another 1,000, but now it was a river I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? He led me back to the bank of the river, and when I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows to the eastern region and goes down to the Arabah where it enters the sea. Again, which sea is that? Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the water flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water flesh, fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. 
fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi. Now we were at En Gedi, right? So at the Dead Sea, opposite En Gedi, fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Aglaim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kind, like the fish of the Great Sea, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for what? Salt, salt. because do we need salt? Yeah, so it'd be nice to have some salt that's relatively close. So the marshes and stuff on the south end, they'll be left for salt. So we get the fish, we get the salt. Hey, best of both worlds, that's great. So that's, that's the prophecy at the time of, uh, of it, this is still future from when Christ comes and fights, that's what's gonna happen to the Mount of Olives that we're sitting on. Now in Christ's life, the Mount of Olives was extremely important. First of all, Bethphage, where Christ spent a lot of time, was close to the top of the Mount of Olives, on the other side, but close to the top. Then Bethany was the, was the city down the other side of the Mount of Olives. We're not exactly positive, but maybe halfway down or something like that was the city of Bethany. And that's where Christ would spend the night. So for example, every day of the last week of his life, he'd spend the night in Bethany. He'd come over one morning, he was walking into Jerusalem, he passed a fig tree and he cursed the fig tree and it dried up immediately. And Peter says, how soon the fig tree is withered away. There was another time he's coming in Jerusalem, he cursed the fig tree and how long did it take the fig tree to wither? overnight absolutely and Jesus Christ walked down in Jerusalem during the day and then he would teach in the temple then he would go home to Bethany at night now the the uh, the Garden of Gethsemane are we do we know exactly where it is no and again like with so many other things depending on your denomination you can pick a spot I there's two or three of them we go to the main traditional one just so you can see some very old olive trees what we do know is that the Garden of Gethsemane was down here on the southern slope of the Mount of Olives now I believe and what I want to talk about now in some detail I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified not far from here toward the top of the Mount of Olives. And there are various reasons for believing that. And I just want to, I'm going to use my notes here, make sure I get this all right and we cover this. But it, this is very important because we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. How was that picked? Basically, Queen Helena got a vision that that's where it was. And, you know, I don't believe that. There's also a place that the Protestants have for, a, for the, uh, what they call the crucifixion site. I will say the Protestant place, it looks like a skull, but it's questionable about whether it looked like a skull 2,000 years ago or whether erosion has helped out a little bit. It is near a garden. There is water there, there are tombs there. Nevertheless, there are reasons that I believe that the Mount of Olives is where the crucifixion had to occur. And I just want to go down and start looking at some of these. First, and I, I didn't bring my illustration, but at the time of Christ, at the time of Christ, there was a bridge running from the East Gate across the valley and connecting into the Mount of Olives. And you, you, if you bought one of those pictures of Jerusalem in the time of Christ, they were selling at the Holy Land Hotel in the model of Jerusalem, you saw that bridge. Also, when we go to the Temple Institute, you will see pictures with that bridge. But that's very important to know that there was a bridge running right from the East Gate across the Kidron Valley. It'd be quite an engineering work and then up over the Mount of Olives because the crucifixion site had to be near a road. If we look at Matthew chapter 27, 41. Matthew chapter 27, verse 41. We read, well, uh, let's see, above his head, okay. We'll start it at verse 39 of Matthew 27, verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their head and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. So the people would pass by on a road. 
And there was definitely a road running over the north, over the top of the Mount of Olives, and a road running down and across that bridge. But the next point says, in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. Now the question would be, if if Jesus Christ was crucified on some hill in, in an out of the way place, would the chief priests and teachers of the law and elders go out of their way to go to the crucifixion site to mock Christ? It's probably not likely, but that bridge was, the, was a main causeway right into the temple. So who would be sure to take it? Priests, elders, exactly. And they would be going right by Jesus Christ to go into Jerusalem via that bridge or via that bridge. And so they, they said, you know, the, the teacher of the law mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he, can't, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe. So, the, so the, the, uh, we know that the chief priests were there. Now, secondly, if you look at Leviticus chapter 4, please, verse 12. I think when we think about the tabernacle and the temple, we think about one altar, that there's just one altar associated with the temple and the tabernacle. Actually, there were three. Now, there's the altar of burnt offering that was right inside the, the curtains or inside the temple itself. Then inside the Holy of Holies, there was the altar of golden incense. And also, at, uh, or was that inside the holy place? Yeah, the holy place. So inside the holy place was the altar of incense. So that made the second altar. And there was a third altar where the bodies of animals that would not be burned. Remember, the, in many cases, the only thing that was burned on the altar of sacrifice inside the temple were the, was the fat in various parts of the body. So what do you do with the rest of these animals? Well, there was an altar outside of the temple where they were burned. I said Leviticus 4. I'm not there myself. I'll get there. Leviticus chapter 4. In verse, uh, well, let's just, let's just start. You know what? Let's just start in verse 1. I want you to really see this and get it. I want you to feel what the sacrifices were like. In Leviticus chapter 4, it says that Yahweh said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, When anyone sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of Yahweh's commands, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt upon the people, he must bring to Yahweh a young bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He's to present the bull at the entrance to the tent of meeting before Yahweh. He's to lay his hands on the head and slaughter it before Yahweh. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood, carry it to the tent of meeting. He is to dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle some of it seven times before Yahweh in front of the curtain of the sanctuary. The priest shall then put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense that's before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The rest of the bull's blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He shall remove all the fat from the bull of the sin offering, the fat that covers the inner part or that's connected with them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. Just as the fat is removed from the ox, sacrificed as a fellowship offering. Verse 10, we're in. Then the priest shall burn them. So he's burning the kidneys, the fat. The priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. But the hide of the bull and all its flesh, as well as its head and its legs, its inner parts and offal, that is, all the rest of the bull, he must take outside the camp to a place ceremonially clean where the ashes are thrown and burn it in a wood fire on the ash heap. Now the question is, where was that? It was outside the, the temple and it was to the east that the, the sin offering, the body of the sin offering was burned in a clean place outside the camp and to the east of the camp. Also, the, um, if you go to, to 
while we're in, we might as well go to Numbers chapter 19. While we're in, while we're back here in the Old Testament, we're going to go to Hebrews in just a second. But let's go to Numbers chapter 19. You all remember the red heifer, right? It was the ashes, the water poured through the ashes of the red heifer that made people clean. If they were ceremonially unclean, they had to be washed with water that had been run through the ashes of the red heifer. And here in Numbers chapter 19, verse 1, um, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to read this, this whole thing, but um, if you look at verse 9, a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer. Well, let's see. Let's just read it. Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, this is a requirement of the law that Yahweh has commanded. Tell the Israelites to bring you a red heifer without defect or blemish and that has never been under a yoke. Give it to Eleazar the priest. It is to be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. Then Eleazar the, the priest is to take some of its blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. While he watches, the heifer is to be burned. So here the heifer, the red heifer is to be burned just like the body of the sin offering was to be burned. It's hide, flesh, and blood in offal. The priest is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet wood, scarlet wool rather, throw them on the burning heifer. After that, the priest must wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. He may then come into the camp, but he will be ceremonially unclean until evening. The man who burns it must also wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he too is to be unclean until evening. Verse 9, a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and put them in a ceremonially clean place outside the camp. They shall be kept by the Israelite community for use in the water of cleansing. Now the question is, does tradition tell us where that happened? And the answer is yes. And if we look, and this is the archaeological... This is the Oxford Archaeological Guide to the Holy Land. I think I've got my page right. Uh, no, so let me look. What page? 121. 121. Bingo. Thank you. Nope. Whoop. Wait a minute. Yep. Okay. Let me read. Thank you, Steve. After the establishment of the temple in Jerusalem, the ritual of the red heifer, rep Numbers 19, 1 to 10, was celebrated on the Mount of Olives, leaving the temple by the east gate. Right there, it's been boarded up. But there's your east gate, leaving the temple by the east gate. The procession was led by the high priest, crossed the Kidron Valley on a special causeway, a special bridge, Remember that I told you that was there? And climbed to the summit where the animal was sacrificed. Now Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is called a sin offering. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And the Greek can also be translated as a sin offering. So the sin offering was burned on the top of the Mount of Olives. The red heifer was burned on the top of the Mount of Olives. If you look at Hebrews, please. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13. In verse 10. Very, very powerful verse. And, and almost completely misunderstood if you checked commentaries. This verse is almost completely misunderstood. It's talking about Jesus Christ in verse 8, the same yesterday, today, forever. Verse 9, don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. Verse 10, we have an altar. We, Christians, have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle or the temple have no right to eat. There was the, the altar of the burnt offering, that the animals that were sacrificed inside the tabernacle, the priests often got to eat a piece. 
but what happened to the animals that came out to the altar that would be east of the, of the temple, east of the tabernacle? They were burned. It says, you know, the, 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 the Jews had an altar of sacrifice inside the temple, inside the tabernacle, but we Christians have an altar, another altar, a different altar of which the priests have no right to eat. What altar could that possibly be? It would have to be the altar east of the temple. So what we're doing now is we're beginning to look at, at reasons why Christ would be crucified on the Mount of Olives. Now, there's also evidence that the, the, uh, the gates to the east were associated with this altar. If you look at Ezekiel 43.21, Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 21. We read, You are to take the bull for the sin offering and burn it in the designated part of the temple area. It's the designated part of the temple area, but it's what? Outside, Outside the sanctuary. Now it's interesting that the, the word designated part, what we gets translated into our English as designated part, and the Hebrew is the myth mikpad. It's M-I-Q, M-I-P rather, M-I-P-H-Q-A-D, Mifkad. That's the word designated place. Interestingly enough, in the city of Jerusalem, there was the Mifkad gate. Now the Mifkad gate would lead to the Mifkad, the designated place. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes great sense. Let's go to Nehemiah 3.31. The book of Nehemiah. Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Chapter 3. And verse 31. And of course, the um, Nehemiah is describing the city of Jerusalem as it's been rebuilt after the Babylonian destruction. It's talking about the rebuilding of the city. Nehemiah 3.31, next to him, Mal Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants did and the merchants, opposite the what? Inspection. It's called inspection gate. That's probably a poor translation. Anybody reading a King James? What's it read? Over against the gate Mifkod. The gate Mifkod in the King James? Beautiful. So it's, it's the Mifkod gate. Now, do we have archaeological evidence of where the Mifkod gate was? Um, what I've got here, this is a, a photocopy I took out of the, an, an atlas of the Bible lands by two Israeli archaeologists, a man named Aharoni. Um, let's see, Avi Yona and Aharoni. And what they do here is they're, they're giving you a picture of Jerusalem. I don't know, if, you know if, how close you can get that, but this is, a, uh, a, this is almost more to show you it's there, and you can take a look at it. It's called the Macmillan Bible Atlas by Aviona and Aharoni. And you can see the city of Jerusalem here. And here is the, the temple up here with the east gate. Right? And then just north of the east gate is the Mifkod gate, leading out to the east. Again, now, right now, of course, the, this city, what's happened to this city? It's gone. Okay? The, the Jerusalem, if you remember, was completely destroyed by the Romans and all that stuff. It's gone. But this was the best reconstruction they could do of the city in Nehemiah's time. And the Mifkod gate went out to the Mifkod, which was the designated place, which is where the animals were sacrificed, which led to the altar outside the city, and where's the gate? Right on the east side. So what we're doing again is we're amassing evidence that Jesus Christ, as the sin offering for mankind, would have been offered where the sin offering was. Did a road lead right by the place? Yes. Would the priests and the elders walk right up and down that road on their way into the temple? Absolutely they would have. Let's keep reading on here. Um, if we go to John chapter 19, verse 20. The Gospel of John, please, chapter 19 and verse 20.
And it says in John 19, 20, and this is very interesting, it says, many of the Jews read this sign. This is the sign on the cross over Jesus Christ's head. If you read verse 19, Pilate had, prepared, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Verse 20, many of the Jews read this sign. Number one, it's on the road. But, but what road is it on? It's on the road leading right into the temple. And the scripture says here, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. This is, this is not translated as well as it could be. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. What The way that this verse should properly be translated is that where Jesus was crucified was near the place of the city. Not the place Jesus was crucified was near the city, but where Jesus was crucified was near the place of the city. So the question is, what, what in the world does that mean? Near the place of the city, again, because this has been lost to theology, it doesn't get translated right. But if we ask ourselves, what is the place of the city? The scripture makes it very clear. Let's go if we can to John chapter 11, verse 48. John chapter 11, in verse 48. What we're going to see is that the word place was the temple. It, I'm going to the place. Everybody understood that was the temple. In John 11, 48, Verse, we'll start at verse 45 for context. Uh, probably need to take a short break, take a short helicopter break. Well, okay, that. let me go back here. Verse 45 of John 11 says, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in them. Verse 46, But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And that, by the way, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Then the, the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting in the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> everyone will believe in him. And then watch this. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What are they worried about losing? their place, they're worried about losing the temple. So the scripture now tells us that where Jesus Christ was crucified was near the place. Well, you're not gonna get much nearer than across a bridge right there. That's pretty close. It also explains why many would come by to read the sign because it's the eve of the Passover. They're gonna be going into the temple to, to worship and praise God. They've come to Jerusalem, they're gonna be blessed. Many are gonna be passing by to go into the temple through that, over that gate and around the other bridges. In John chapter 19, verse 17. In John 19, in verse 17, we read, verse 17, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others. And it ought to read, here they crucified him and with him two others on each side and Jesus in the middle. The word one is not in your Greek text, but it says that they carried him to a place of the skull. Now, the traditional Protestant site today called Gordon's Calvary, if you look at it from a distance, the way the cisterns, there were, there was a hillside, there were cisterns on the hill. When the hillside eroded, those cisterns were exposed, and that makes it look like two eyes and a kind of a, a mouthy thing. And so it looks like the place of a skull, and so people say, oh, look, the place of the skull. This must be where Jesus was crucified. The question is, did the people of the time think that it looked like a skull and is that at all what it's being talked about? The fact of the matter is that 
They use the word skull the same way you, we use the word head in like a head count. If we do a head count, we do one, two, three, four, we're counting people. That's what a head count's about. Now the word skull is used 12 times in the Old Testament. Nine out of those 12, it doesn't refer to a skull at all, but a, a counting or a numbering of people. Let's see a couple of these. Let's go to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listing every man by name, and then one by one is actually this word, and in Hebrew it's Googleath, in Aramaic it's Golgotha. You know, you, how, do you, how do you take a census? By their head, by their skull, that way. And, it's, and nine times out of 12, the word Golgotha in the Old Testament is used of a counting place. Not, a, not something that looked like a skull, but a counting. The other three times it's just literal that, like for instance, Jezebel, dogs ate everything, but there was nothing left but her hands and her head or her skull. Okay, so three times it's literal skull, and nine times it's a place of counting. The question is, do you, do you remember the temple tax that you had to pay? Is, was there a place where they counted the people for the temple tax? Yes, there was. Where was that place? On top of the Mount of Olives. If you're describing to the people and you, you want to tell people where the crucifixion is and you say, they went to Golgotha, they went to where the head count was, everybody would know where that was. We have an altar outside the city. Everybody know where that was. There's a, a, there's a designated place outside the city. Everybody knew where that was. It's all associated with the Mount of Olives. Now also, if you check your Roman history, by the way, there's a great book out by Ernest Martin called Secrets of Golgotha. I don't agree with every word that he says, but it's very good. He gives very good documentation from Roman law and Roman custom that if someone was crucified, they did their best to crucify the person where the crime was committed. Now the reason for that, if you remember, what was the purpose of crucifixion? It, it was to cause public terror. It was, I mean, obviously it was to kill the guy, but it was, the, you know, you kill the guy in a lot of ways. You don't need to crucify him. It was to cause public terror. So you want to cause terror where the trouble was so that the trouble will die down. If you couldn't cru crucify the man where the crime was committed, you tried to crucify him where the arrest took place. Now, Christ was crucified by Pilate for what crime? Treason. He claimed, they, the, the, the Jews brought him to, to Pilate and said, this man claims he's a king. Pilate said, are you a king? He said, yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. Nevertheless, he said he was a king. Where was he proclaimed king openly? Where did the populace support him and proclaim him king? Right as he came down the Mount of Olives. Let's take a look there. Let's go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse 38. In verse 37, where, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, again, it goes across the top of the Mount of Olives. It also goes down the Mount of Olives. The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And they said, verse 38, blessed is the king, king who comes in the name of the Lord. So he was declared king by the people right here on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. Where was he arrested? The Garden of Gethsemane, right on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. Also, now this is interesting, as long as we're in Luke, go to Luke chapter 23. Now there were many, many miraculous things that happened around the time of Christ's crucifixion. You know about the darkness in the land and all that type of thing. 
But in uh, Luke chapter 23, verse, uh, verse 44, It says, it was now the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the st sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a Lord, loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he, had seen, when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. Now, it's, it's interesting that there's, an, there's some keys here. If you coordinate this with the other four Gospels, the centurion saw a lot. By the way, there are Gospels that say that, um, and how does the King James translate the, the verse 47, Steve? Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Right, certainly this was a righteous man. In another Gospel, he says, you know, certainly this was the Son of God. Or uh, it's, it's questionable whether he said a son of God, meaning a righteous man, or the son of God. But I think the centurion was not ignorant about what it was being proclaimed of Christ. He was not ignorant of the sign over his head. He would have been standing right there. He may have heard Christ utter the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's very possible that the centurion said, this man is the son of God. It's very possible that that's exactly what he said, even though from the Greek, you can read it as certainly, surely this was a righteous man, just as the Gospel of Luke says it. However, it's interesting that it says here, verse 47, the centurion, watch this, seeing what had happened, seeing not hearing, not knowing, but seeing. And when it says what had happened, the Greek text is specific that there's one thing, seeing the one happening. Now, if you, other gospels will point to other happenings, but the gospel of Luke is very clear that the centurion seeing one happening said, surely this was the Son of God. In the context, there's only two things he could have seen. One is the darkness. The other is the temple veil being ripped. The only place you can see the temple veil being ripped from is here on the Mount of Olives. The temple would have stood about where the Dome of the Rock is, maybe slightly to the north, and the temple veil would have been 80 feet high. That curtain of the temple would have been eight stories. It's, that's one serious piece of cloth. Standing here on the Mount of Olives, you could see that cloth rip. You could physically see it rip. This is the only place from which you can see the temple veil rip. You can't see it from other, from other places or whatever. So I think this is another great key that the crucifixion occurred on top of the Mount of Olives. Then in John 19:41, we don't need to really go there. The scripture says there was a garden there. We know the Garden of Gethsemane was around. There was then and there is now a bunch of gardens on the Mount of Olives. We also knew that no, there was a new tomb. Well, take a look. There's 80,000 graves or something like that on the Mount of Olives. It's, it's crazy. It's amazing. There's always been tombs galore in the Mount of Olives because, as Francis pointed out, this valley in front of us is the valley called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means judgment in the Old Testament. The people were supposed to be raised from the dead and then judged in this valley. They didn't want to have to travel far when they got resurrected, so the Mount of Olives has always been the primary place. By the way, how expensive do you think a grave site is on the Mount of Olives? Expensive. Very expensive, and it specifically says in the Gospels that Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy person. So Joseph of Arimathea could afford the real estate on the Mount of Olives to hew out a new tomb. So then if we take a conclusion, we've got a lot going for a crucifixion on the Mount of Olives. You know, first of all, as the ultimate sin offering, Christ should have been offered close to where the other sin offerings were. The top of the Mount of Olives was near the place of the temple. 
especially given the fact there was a bridge. The Mount of Olives was the place of the skull, the place of the counting for Israel for the taxes. A crucifixion on the Mount of Olives would have fulfilled the Roman custom of crucifying someone near the place of the crime or the place of arrest. Luke indicates the centurion saw something. If he saw one thing, that thing would have been the temple veil rent rending, and he would have been able to see that from here. Of course, the Mount of Olives was close to the roads, which is why the chief priests would have gone by and the elders and the scribes to mock him, and why also that the, the crowds, it said, would have passed by on their way into the temple. And of course, we're near tombs and near gardens. So for my money, as I've studied the scripture and tried to put this together, there is no other location I can think of where Jesus Christ would have been crucified. And then in just a, a quick footnote, not only would he have been crucified here, but when he ascended, Luke chapter 24 says he ascended from Bethany, which would be on the other side of the Mount of Olives. So this is a, a fantastic Absolutely tremendous spot as we go down the Mount of Olives. So many things happened here. And I really believe this is one of the holiest sites in Israel.